strangers often ask me online. They'll find my Instagram profile. I'll be like, what's wrong with you? This doesn't happen. People don't just get sick and don't get better. At 14, it seemed like overnight I got sick. I lost 15 pounds in the matter of a week. I was burning up, body aches, everything. I was in the hospital for two months. They put me on an oxygen tank, had chemo for six weeks. I didn't care if someone told me that I was, that I was dying. I just wanted someone to tell me something. My name is Eleanor Wheeler. I have a rare genetic connective tissue disease called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. It affects my joints. I can walk a little bit. I use a wheelchair most of the time. My name is Cassandra. I have lupus. It's an autoimmune disease. It affects my kidneys and other organs. My name is Giuliani Alvarenga. I'm HIV undetectable. I've worked really hard to stay undetectable now for almost two years. Undetectable equals untransmittable. My name is Henrietta Ivanance McIntyre. When I was 13 years old, I was diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. I'm a two-time kidney transplant recipient. My name is Matt Taro. I have type 1 diabetes. Your pancreas completely stops making insulin. From waking up in the morning, the first thing I think about, whether or not my blood sugar is in range or out of range. It's almost a relief for a second because you feel like, okay, I wasn't crazy. Something was actually wrong with me. But then, now you know what it is. Now what are you gonna do? How am I supposed to live my life now? If I'm single, how do I tell people I'm gonna date? If I'm married, how do I get my partner to adjust to the fact that now I'm gonna be sick forever? How do I explain to my friends that I can't go to dinner because I'm too tired? How do I get my family to not chronically worry about if I'm gonna die suddenly or not. When I first got sick, my only experience with doctors really up until that point was you go to the doctor's office, they instantly know what's wrong with you, and they can fix it. It's a tall order to try and convince people who have only had short-lived physical experiences to ever truly understand what we have gone through. There's a vast understanding of diabetes and most people are on the shallow end of it. Words hurt tremendously. It seems like you're just lazy. You've inflicted this disease on yourself. Maybe you're just depressed. Maybe you should just see a therapist. Just try harder, just get up, you're fine. Well, you look great. Well, you look great. But you don't get it, you don't get it. Illness especially illness that is incurable and lifelong, is really hard to talk about because we've been trained not to talk about it. We've been trained and told to be ashamed of it. My grandmother is a very private person. She told me, keep it to yourself unless someone asks. Nobody has to know what you go through except you. And something in the back of my head clicked like, no, everybody's gonna know. I'm telling everybody. Once we start talking about it, we kill the stigma, we normalize it, and we allow people to feel more comfortable with talking about what's going on in their lives. And the more you talk about it, the more it creates an understanding. Everyone is given the chance to thrive better because they're better understood. I want people with invisible illnesses to feel seen. This is my life. This is my normal. I am not ashamed of my story. I am proud of my story. All of what it entails, the sad parts, the angry parts, the happy parts, the triumphs, the failures, all of it.
it's, it's a hard juggling act mm -hmm. when one person's sick and the other one's a caregiver. When I was 13 years old, I was diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. And when I was 19, I had my first kidney transplant donated to me by my mother. I met my husband, Kevin, in Toronto. I was in my second year of theater school. I remember thinking, how can he have this capability of making me feel so protected and safe? And it's, um, it's a role he really owned. He really just owned. I was 39 when I was diagnosed with kidney rejection. I literally looked like I was dying, and I literally was dying. So they knew I was going to lose the kidney. I picked up the phone, and the nurse, she just said, um, how are you? And I said, ah, I've been better. And she said, well, it's great news. You're the match. And I remember just going, oh my god. The fact that he was a match to give me a kidney was kind of mind blowing. Yeah. Transplant rejection was very much, I feel, like a triggering point for my addiction that had been there all along. For a long period of time, I was only abusing one medication, and then everything just escalated. Every single time I did it, I swore to him, I won't do this again, I'll just take them as prescribed, and I couldn't, I couldn't. He never left my side and still fought and fought and fought for me and was an advocate. He was this incredible caregiver who paid the mortgage, driving me to every appointment, and had very little for himself. When I was 42, I went into rehab. It's easier now because I got sober, truthfully. It's a choice every day yeah. to walk the steps together, like yeah. walk those steps together. Yeah. I don't even like the word caregiver because you're partners. You're not giving care in the sense of like, it seems like it's a job and it's really not. It's part of being in a relationship. You, you learn how to be helpful, but not um, codependent. You know, I mean, look, long-term relationships, there's always things that come up, always. And we've worked really, really hard to get to the place we're at today. Going through what we have gone through, not just with my transplant, but with me as an active addict, it's been extraordinary. What are we at, 26 years? We're in a pretty good place today. <laughs> I haven't met anyone in a while that I've been like, wow, like let's let's sit and let's have this conversation and let's like be into each other. It's hard to trust that someone would understand what it's like to be with a sick person. Prior to me being diagnosed with lupus, I never wore makeup. It's kind of the illusion that I look a lot better than I feel. I think a lot of people maybe when they hear lupus, they think of some other disease that's curable. It's an autoimmune disease, which means that my immune system attacks itself. For most of us, we have a lot of the same symptoms, uh, brain fog, joint pain, fatigue. Mine specifically affects all of my organs. I am in pain every day, all the time, every minute of every day, for the last six years. I have had a hospital stay at least every six months. I feel guilty if I am like with someone or interested in someone, knowing that there is going to be a lot of my life spent in hospitals, in doctor's offices. It seems unfair to ask another person to love me enough to be okay with all of these things. Do you tell them four weeks in when they've already invested their time? Do you tell them immediately and give them the option to make a decision, but not even really knowing what that decision entails. I was with someone for two years, and I felt like she didn't believe that I was sick. As the trust disintegrated, 
so did everything else. She came to see me in the hospital. I think maybe a part of her felt like she needed to see that, like, I was telling the truth. I have not been in a relationship since then. It's not that I think that I don't deserve a long-term relationship. Love is asking someone to choose to be with you. And I don't feel like I've reached a point where I can ask someone to do that with me. I think HIV is more stigmatized than other conditions because it's associated with sex. And sex is such a taboo subject. From what I've heard from long-term HIV survivors who lived in that era, people were scared. People did not talk about it. Like, people didn't even have a proper goodbye. I remember being as a kid, just passing by this park with my dad. I never knew that what this meant, you know, until I got older, you know? It means a lot to me to be here. And, and just to read the names of some of these people, they're no longer with us, but we still honor them by coming back to this space. I'm HIV undetectable. When you're undetectable, it means that the virus is dormant. It's not attacking your body. Science has proven that undetectable means you can't transmit it to someone else. And what we need to start doing now that we have science on our side is getting, you know, the social science aspect of it now. I've had weird situations like online with some guy that wanted to shame me. It's easier to shame someone than it is to critically think about the situation. I'll be on Tinder or Bumble. They see all the work that I'm doing with HIV, and they ask, are you HIV positive? And that's when I say, yeah, you know, I'm very honest about it, you know, rip the Band-Aid kind of thing. I want to be able to be with a partner where I could just be myself. I'm aware that I have HIV, but I also am aware that I can give so much more to someone. I know the value of my worth. I would tell someone who thinks that they can't have a healthy, long-lasting relationship because of their status to reconsider those thoughts. I know that it takes time and it's a process. Love is unconditional. They're going to find someone who's going to want to get to know them and see something deeper than HIV.